Hey, Trevor, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. I actually don't know if my speakers are working. Can you hear me, Gary? I, I mean, Ryan, who is it? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to turn on security in order to prevent a photo bombing. <laughs> Okay. Right, they can't unmute themselves, so then they can't jump in. Yeah, uh no. -huh. Okay. Pretty good crowd. Should be able to. I don't know why that one's not on. Or is it space bar for next? Um, just space bar. Yeah, the problem is. That's just as good as it could be. Go ahead and jump in. Go ahead and jump in. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joel Johnson. I'm a PhD student here at NAU and APMS. And today I'm going to be sharing some exciting uh, results coming out of our lab. Uh, the title is Optomechanical Cooling and Liquid Core Optical Fiber. Brief outline, I'm going to explain what optomechanical cooling is. I'm going to show some nice pictures of our liquid core sample. I'm going to uh, present the pump probe results and explain how they support our pump only results. And then I'll give some concluding analysis of these uh, data. So optimal, optimal mechanical cooling at its essence is just light scattering off of sound. So if you have a material at room temperature, it has some thermal fluctuations and we can call these density waves, um, you know, mechanical fluctuations, we'll call them sound waves. And so in the diagram down below, I have capital uh, uh, omega to represent sound waves. If you have a laser light incident on a phonon, which is just the quanta of sound, just like a uh, photon is quanta of light, uh, represented by lowercase omega, it has a chance to backscatter off of the approaching, in this case, sound wave. And this is called Brewon scattering. And if it is indeed an approaching sound wave, then you have an energy transfer in this scattering event. So energy transfers from the sound to the light or from the phonon population to the photon population. Uh, so that means the returning light is frequency upshifted or blue shifted and energy conservation, the sound wave intensity is then lowered or cooled. So that's the material being cooled. There's also the opposite scenario, optimal mechanical heating. Uh, the only thing that flips is the retreating sound wave uh, is now, uh, the sound wave is now retreating instead of approaching. And so the energy transfer goes the other way. So this time energy transfers from light to sound and the returning light is frequency downshifted. And this is uh, uh, results in the sound wave then being heated, the phonon population increasing. So if you pay attention to the widths of the arrows here, I'm trying to give a qualitative representation of like the intensity of what's going on with uh, the phone in there. So why do we care? Very briefly, noise reduction. So if you have a lower thermal energy 
And these fiber systems, especially ones that are exploiting, uh, using rewind scattering to exploit some of these modes, lower thermal uh, energy re uh, results in uh, lower noise, which is uh, great for applications that are based on these kinds of phenomena. And then a future project that we're just beginning to kind of get started on in our lab that's exciting is exploring ground state cooling with the same optomechanical cooling phenomena in combination with a cryostat. So here's a diagram of our liquid core optical fiber sample. So you have SMF28, which is just basic cheap fiber spliced to UHNE7, so it tapers down in core. And then you have that angle spliced to one meter of very special hollow core fiber. So it comes hollow. And because of that angle splice, we uh, allow liquid to enter into and fill the whole core of this one meter of hollow core fiber. It fills via ca uh, capillary action. And it takes about a day and a half to two days. <laughs> um, and the liquid is carbon disulfide. And why carbon disulfide? It has the highest free one being you know, materials here in this list, um, which is based off of just material properties, speed of sound and other things. So here's an actual picture of this splice. This is one splice, a lot of architecture around it because it's delicate. So it's not fully spliced together. You have that angle and it's very delicate. So we tack it down with glue and we put a vial with uh, the bottom cut off to be the uh, you know, liquid reservoir for that CS2 to seep in. So if you were to look under a microscope at that splice center, you see this very, very tiny, you may not even be able to see, it's a very tiny little uh, gap there. And it turns out that's large enough for carbon disulfide to enter and fill the core. We started with larger gaps, but it turns out uh, that's all that's needed. And the more closed it is, the better optical transmission. So, um, and then on the right, you see a picture of what it looks like on the optical bench. So that's that full meter. And you have one of these little vial, uh, you know, angle splice contraptions on either end. So the first experiment I'm gonna talk about is our pump probe experiment. So if we have a higher power pump, optomechanically cooling the sample, it's in the same way that I started the talk with, and we add a lower power probe to ind independently verify that the sample is being probed, uh, we're going to be collecting this backscattered probe light, and we're not going to be varying the probe power. So that's the most important part of this experiment, is the probe power incident on the phonons, uh, this one here, is being kept constant and we're gonna increase the pump power. And so if we have cooling happening in the sample, in the anti-Stokes mode, right, with the approaching phonons, uh, if we have cooling going on, then we're killing the phonon population in the anti-Stokes mode. And so even though we're sending the same amount of power an incident probe uh, signal, it has lower probability of scattering because there's just less phonon population to scatter off of. And so we should get less probe light returned back to us as we collect. But if you look carefully at the widths of the arrows, I try to get give an idea of the dynamics of the situation. So as such, the returning probe light here, uh, we want to see that as we increase the pump power, we see the spectral peak lowering. Spectral peak just refers to the amount of photons being collected at the detector. Um, so if we're getting less backscattered light, that's lower spectral peak. And another known indicator of optomechanical cooling is that the line width broadens. So the shape of the spectra that we're getting back from this probe backscattered light is a Lorentzian. And with increasing pump power, we want that Lorentzian to widen increasingly. So this is the design of the setup to carry out this very complex experiment. So we have a probe line and we have a pump line. And we have our sample over to the right and our collector, our detector down at the bottom. So remember the pump is what is optomechanically cooling the sample and uh, the probe is being kept constant. So as we increase the pump power, we increase the amount of cooling in that anti-Stokes mode in the sample and the probe constant and low power comes in. It's orthogonal and polarization. That's how it's independent. So this is a polarizing beam splitter. So uh, it takes a straight path through it, back scatters and takes a straight path back through uh, the polarizing beam splitter. Hangs left of the circulator, collected down at the bottom. 
So here's our results. Like I said, low probe power intentionally because we don't want the probe to be influencing the situation. We want the probe to be cooling it itself. We want it to be a low power check. So we wanted it uh, intentionally as a lower signal to noise, but just enough to distinguish um, what we needed to see. And you can see that there is a very clear height difference here. As you increase the pump, the spectral height lowers quite significantly. So that's very positive results. And then the other check that we wanted to uh, verify was that the widths are broadening as the pump power increases. So that's given by the dotted lines there. Give a different uh, plot here because it's very hard to tell from the previous. So I plotted full width half max of uh, with increasing pump power um, of those uh, fit lines. And you can see that it does increase, it does broaden with increasing pump power. And these values are, uh, they correlate to what's expected. So with these results, uh, we can confidently say that the pump is cooling the sample because we didn't change the code power at all, but the backside of light we get uh, is affected because of what the pump is doing. That's the point of this experiment here. And so because we see these characteristic signs of optomechanical cooling, we can confidently proceed knowing that the pump is cooling the sample and we can put our foot fully on the gas and look at pump only data to see the full potential of this cooling in this system. So in this next experiment, so I'm calling pump only experiment, no probe, only pump, right? So this time we're collecting the backscattered uh, pump light, backscattered pump light here. And I put a you know, little reference diagram from the previous experiment up there in the top right. This time we're collecting the pump, oops, the pump backscattered light, and we're also increasing the pump power. And so because we're doing that, we have to look at both the anti-Stokes and the Stokes modes, because if we're sending out more photons and then we're collecting that same source that we're increasing the power of, even if we're killing the phonons, right? Lowering the probability of that free one scattering, um, thereby, you know, we would think we would have a lesser chance to get backscattered photons in our collected light. We're increasing the amount of photons, photons we're sending so significantly with each pump step up that we're still going to get an increase, even in the anti-stokes mode where there's cooling. So what we need to see is that there's a relative height change between anti-stokes and stokes. Stokes should have many, many more photons returning, right? So spectral height should be growing much more rapidly in the stokes where the phonons are being heated than the anti-stokes where they're being cooled. So that's what we will be looking for, relative spectral height change. And then the line width indicator remains the same. With anti-stokes cooling, we want to see that it broadens, and with stokes heating, we want to see that it narrows. So here's the design of the setup for this experiment, much simpler. There's no probe, there's just a pump, but the idea is the same. There's no polarization component. The pump uh, power is increased. We have this optomechanical cooling in one mode and heating in another mode. And remember, all that refers to is just the directions that the longitudinal sound waves are traveling or phonons are traveling in this sample. And then that pump light is sent back, mixed with the LL and collected at the spectrum analyzing there. So what do we get? With increasing pump power, with anti-stokes on the left and stokes on the right, we see a very, very significant differential in spectral heights, indicative of that cooling, right? So we wanted to see that break in symmetry. So we knew they were both gonna be growing, but we wanted to see stokes growing much more rapidly, and it is. So bringing these together for closer inspection, the slick animation, that is our cooling right there. That is a big deal. The other thing that we wanted to see is the widths, right? We wanted anti stokes, the lower one there, to be broadening with increasing pump power. And we wanted to see that the stokes was narrowing. And we can see that the anti stokes is indeed much broader, especially for higher pump powers than the stokes. To quantify this, done another plot and added all the data points. Uh, so this is a height ratios. So Stokes spectral peaks divided by anti-Stokes spectral peaks. So going back a plot here, it's taking the peak of each one, right? At each power level and just dividing Stokes by anti-Stokes. And so if Stokes is outpacing anti-Stokes, we should see 
an increase with pump power, which we very much do. So that, uh, that checks out. And then for the line widths, we see a general trend that we want to see. So we see a uh, full width half max of anti Stokes and Stokes plotted here. The anti Stokes in blue and the Stokes in red. And we want to see a general trend of widening in the anti Stokes and narrowing in the Stokes. And we do see that general trend. So with this, we see clear evidence of cooling. We see the spectral height ratios change and the line widths trend in the direction that they should. So we can quantify this by looking at the, uh, the line width differential in the, in the anti-stokes. We wanted to quantify the cooling going on in the anti-stokes mode. You take uh, the, the, the differential, which is about 25 megahertz, and you can calculate that out to uh, find that that is about a 60 Kelvin temperature drop, which is a very much a, a wow result. That's a large temp temperature drop in that anti-stokes mode. So uh, what, what this actually is, is in the anti-stokes mode, in one of the directions where phonons are traveling in this liquid core optical fiber, we have cooled, we have killed the phonon population, reduced the thermal fluctuations, made a quieter mode for applications to then exploit um, that are based on those those phenomena. So with that, I want to give strong acknowledgement to uh, my advisor, Ryan Mahunin, his infinite uh, source of knowledge and patience, and, uh, and our collaborators, Neil Otterstrom, Otterstrom from Sandia and Peter Rakic of the Rakic Group at Yale University. Thank you. Uh, great talk, great talk. Thank Can you. you like that last slide? This one. Seems like they were pretty generous on the empty stokes there. How confident are you in that? This is going to greatly affect this temperature drop, right? It is, it is. I need to analyze this actually a lot further. So this is at the, like, um, this, this presentation is, is an exciting point because we just got this data, but we need to fully analyze it. So I haven't done like a goodness of fit test. I haven't binned the data. I've done all the things that are going to contribute to a little bit cleaner fitting. Um, I guess that's the best I can speak to it. This is very, very recent data. So uh, we see a general trend towards what we're wanting. What is, is this 60K uh, temperature drop? Is that kind of what you're headed towards? How, where do you think is the potential in terms of uh, an ultimate drop that you get to? Um, well, yeah. with more power, I guess you would be able to get more. This is pretty significant. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the most exciting next step for further temperature drop would be uh, involving also cryostats. So like two things in combination would be really neat. Um, so if you have cryogenic control of the temperature, in addition to this, like I mentioned, kind of the next project that's exciting is ground state cooling. So that would further cool the mode to you know, ground state. It could be really exciting. Uh, okay. Do you have another question? question. <laughs> Like How do you see that new shift at the intermediate power rate? Uh, do you see there's a, yeah. You mean a, yeah. a spectral shift? Uh, yeah, I think that that's more to do with the signal to noise ratio than actual physical. Uh, Sort of sources of that. Um, like I said, we're, we're keeping the probe power very low. Um, and, and yeah, I, there, there's, there's places that my mind go to answer that if it were a continual change, but since it's not, I'm thinking it's just not a, um, uh, it's not a, you know, as high signal to noise as would be needed for those to line straight up. And related question in another number of slides later, you go from the show that the anti-stoke saturates with, with uh, power. Ah, uh, yes. What is significant in that? What does that mean physically? So you, you mean like the green isn't much more than the red yeah. here? Yeah, uh, it's possible that we're reaching saturation. I haven't done those calculations to see if that is the case here, but it's it's possible that, uh, you know, it's like an asymptote of, of, of approach here. And so it takes much more power with each, uh, uh, it's a nonlinear step up in power that, that, that results in, um, you know, the same amount of cooling, uh, if I said that correctly. 
you are reaching some sort of saturation, like you said. Yeah, that is correct. So I think you have a question on the network structure. So if you pull up the um, participants, might be able to do it here. Yeah. Ask to unmute. Very good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, Joel, this really is a wow result. Uh, very impressive. I, I'm thinking my colleague here at ASU, uh, Yong Hang Zhang, are you familiar with his work? He had an Air Force contract, and I can't remember the details, but I think he was growing some kind of indium arsenide, gallium antimonide, quantum well or heterostructure and doing laser cooling. And I think they were only getting a few degrees Kelvin cooling. So the fact that you're getting 60s is kind of astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, this so, is remarkable. Yeah, so I, so I had a question. So when can I use this to instantly cool my martinis? What's the, uh, <laughs> what, what's the heat capacity of the, of the liquid-filled fiber that yeah, you're cooling? Yeah. Um, well, so, okay, that brings up an, a really uh, important point is that, you know, we have anti-Stokes cooling, but we also have Stokes heating. So the overall temperature of the fiber itself is not cooling. Um, it's just the one mode. So that one direction of travel of the phonons that's cool. I see. Okay, so I misunderstood that. So, so you know, what are the what what are the applications that you have in mind? Um, there's a few really interesting ones that I can't go into too much detail about, but really any application that would benefit from noise control based on thermal fluctuations. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, good, good. Well done. Thanks very much. Great talk. Thank you. So if you look at the phonon modes, particularly on a liquid there are nets. There's all kinds of things vibrating. Yeah. At all kinds of so I guess my question is can you target those specifically? And how does the cross section with respect to those change if you go from one frequency to another? Yeah, you're right. There's a whole family of modes. Um so you can uh you can target so, so these this is spontaneous free one scattering. You can have stimulated blue one scattering where you're exploiting the two um, to vibrate at a specific mode given to oppositely entering laser sources. Uh, but this is spontaneous measurement, so it's dependent on the material itself. The carbon is sulfide and its material properties uh, give rise to a specific frequency, and it's like about 2.26, 2.25 uh, resonant blue one frequency. Does that answer your question? Can you select a different frequency? Uh, with spontaneous, I I don't have a clear answer. I don't have a confident answer to that. What if you change the buffer? Oh yeah, if 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 you change the um, I have to think about that. I have to think about that. I I think the answer is right, but I think my mind is going. <laughs> right, it's turned into a comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so that's an important question. So I think I might yeah, have a I think I have a slide that might help explain the answer, if I'm understanding your question correctly. So in the blue here, uh, 1549 nanometers. And so I didn't, I kind of swept it under the rug, but uh, 1549 is coming out, back scattering. It gets shifted by about two and a quarter gigahertz, comes back and through heterodyne spectroscopy, right? Mixes with the LO, and you get this beat note of two and a quarter gigahertz. It's about half the frequency then? Okay. It's very, very small compared to yeah, very, very small change. And um, it's just the, the fact that we can get this beat note when it mixes with the LL that allows us to get that difference frequency at two and four. Any other questions? Thank you very much for an engaging discussion and listening to the talk.
Are your covers now? So you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Maybe the extend. Oh, can you change it to just a letter? Oh, you're going to oh, sure. There you go. That should clear that. Lots of photos. Okay, I think we're ready. And then let me just drag some. So I'll share my screen on that screen. So you're just going to project. Okay, so everybody should be seeing the same thing. This is good. That way I can actually see where my mouse is. And then, yeah, let me just do that. Drag a few things over real quick. Okay. Don't forget, I'll turn the laser pointer on so people can see where I'm pointing at. Okay. Well, good afternoon or good evening. I don't know which it is, to be honest. So, uh, <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about uh, optimizing gold nano seed or gold seeds uh, for nanorod synthesis. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Blake, um, and uh, I work with Dr. Wetton. And uh, this is my family. Uh, <laughs> this is our little Halloween photo shoot. Uh, she wasn't too happy, but <laughs> it, it didn't last very long. So um, yeah, I started NAU back in January. It was kind of offbeat. Uh, there's a phone on joke for you. And uh, I got my master's at ASU in 2017. I, like I said, I've been working with Dr. Wetton and uh, like my young child, my project is still in its infancy. So we'll go from there. Uh, first of all, just to give some context, most of you are pretty familiar with nano sizes, but I wanted to come up with a, a fun way to kind of explain it. And so I figured this is a particle that we'll be talking about later on. Um, it's about, yeah, about a nanometer-ish. And then your eyeball is about 2.5 centimeters in diameter. And so if we took and try to put this in perspective, if we turned that particle into a beach ball, then your eye would blow up to about the size of, a, of the world. And uh, just to make it a little more exciting, I put, the, I put it inside the eyeball for you. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, it, it, it's small. Um, it's kind of hard, actually. I, I still don't really understand how small it is because I don't think we can understand things on that length scale. But um, so we're talking about these gold nanoclusters and we're using them as seeds for nanorod synthesis. But why do we care about gold nanorods in the first place? Well, they have some pretty, uh, some pretty important roles. And uh, the main one is cancer treatment. Uh, you can see here, they're taking these gold nano rods and they're putting them in the little rat. And then they can use them for imaging. Um, so the gold nano rods, they interact with light really nicely. Uh, and you can tune that interaction, which is great. So they can use it to kind of identify, you know, where are these uh, nano rods accumulating? But more so, uh, they can take here, you can see, it's kind of small, I know. They're taking the, uh, the outer core is CTAB, that's the ligand, and they're replacing it with a bioadaptive mole molecule. And uh, so this molecule is able to interact more directly with the cells and specifically target certain types of cells because it can get there and it can, you know, kind of open up like an envelope when it gets to the right, to the right combination of um, membranes. And then here they show, they actually wrap a bunch of these little nanorods up inside of a bioadaptive membrane and once it gets into the cell that opens it up, then it can kind of deliver its little package. And then it's showing a combination effect where the C-tab, which is this uh, surfactant that is involved, or, or we could call it a detergent if you'd rather. Um, so the surfactant detergent, it actually has some toxicity to it. And so once it opens up that little capsule and delivers these nanorods, then you get the toxicity of the detergent. But in addition to that, now you can hit that 
with the right wavelength of light and it heats it up. And so you can destroy the cells quite effectively using this technique. So the takeaway is nanorods can be used, uh, gold nanorods specifically can be used to target and destroy cancer cells. So what makes the nanorod special is that it is tunable. Like I said, you can take the aspect ratio of the nanorod and it directly affects the wavelengths that it interacts with. So you take these little shorty guys and you can imagine it's, it's kind of intuitive. If you have a short nanorod, a long wavelength isn't gonna to wanna to interact with that short nanorod. So as you lengthen the nanorod, the interaction with longer wavelengths of light happens. And you can see that here. So we start here down at uh, like 615 nanometers. And then when we move up to these longer, skinnier nanorods, we're getting up to 793. So it's highly tunable as to its response to um, light. Now the synthesis of the nanorods themselves um, is a pretty interesting process. First, you have to make these seeds. And so you use those using a strong uh, reducing agent and then you have a re weak reducing agent and you create uh, kind of this little magical juice that you put your seeds in and then they start to grow into nano rods. And that happens um, from, it's a self-assembly process. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, we haven't grown the nano rods ourselves because we're focusing more on the seeds in this particular um, focus. So the seed synthesis, uh, here's an example of kind of the pre-mixture. This is the detergent, the C-tab mixed with some gold that's in solution. And then we use the strong reducing and we're able to get this nice brown color, which indicates that we're, we're getting something that's uh, very, very tiny. And these nano, these nano clusters are, are quite tiny. And so um, the gold solution is this uh, gold chloride, use a C-tab, and then the reducing agent creates a lot of free hydrogen, and that's what we use in the, in the reduction of that particular system. So the question now is like, we're focusing on these seeds, but how important is the role that seeds play? I don't know if that, any of you have ever seen a movie called uh, Secondhand Lions, but there's a particular scene in there where a traveling salesman comes and he sells a bunch of different vegetable seeds to them. And a few months later, when they're harvesting the garden, they're looking around and it all looks exactly the same. And so they they figure out that uh, he conned them and just sold them a bunch of corn seed. Um, and what we see is that not only in gardening, but also in uh, the gardening of nanorods, there is a strong influence that the nano, nanoparticles have on that. And so you can see here, this seed um, solution has a pretty high, this is telling you the uh, size distribution of the seeds themselves. And so this one's got some pretty small ones. Uh, as it ages, they, they go through what's called Oswald ripening, where the smallest seeds kind of sacrifice themselves to the bigger seeds, and it just keeps going like that until you get some big fatties like this. And what you see is that as the seeds get bigger and bigger, the nanorod uh, population and quality gets lower and lower. And so we see that the nanorod quality and the nano cluster sizes are kind of inversely proportional. And I could add quantity as well to quality here because you can see that there's just not as many that are being produced. So the role of the seed size um, has been studied. Uh, in this particular case, it was studied using, um, they had a flow through cell in this, in this experiment. And what they did is they introduced a fresh solution of seeds into the flow through cell. And so the nanorod growth was happening they don't give a whole lot of specifics as to like what was the dwell time in this flow through cell because it was a static mixer. But at some point in the static mixer, they had a little window, they shot their IR through there and they got this UV vis data. And then uh, they figured it out to where they could look at what's the relative nanorod concentration at that particular point in this flow through cell. And what you can see is the green starts with the introduction of a fresh solution of nano seeds uh, or, uh, of these seed clusters. And as they age and grow, the production of the nanorod, you know, it peaks at some point, but then it rapidly decays and you get hardly any nanorods being produced. And then, so they introduce again, a fresh solution of seeds and you see this growth, it peaks back, picks back up. So it's a pretty good indication that, yeah, it's kind of critical that we need to get those small nano, uh, those small seed clusters to actually grow these nanorods. And we also have a supporting preprint um, that goes even further to say that gold 32 seeds are critical for the synthesis of these nano rods. And that's kind of what spurred us all on to look into this in the first place. 
So quickly, we'll go over the symmetry of the Gold 32 uh, nanocluster. It has a virus-like or a casahedral structure on the interior. Uh, it's coated in a little dodecahedron of some more gold. And then uh, the ligand structure, um, it's expressed as 12 and 8. Uh, in reality, these um, they kind of all just form a dodecahedron together. And whether or not, you know, in some cases, you might have it to where just the eight, um, these eight don't interact with, like, a, you might have a counter ion and the 12 do. But in reality, I think a lot of that's still up in the air. In this particular case, bromine is what's kind of coating all of these. And then the C-tab would be the counter ion for the bromine. So uh, here's a little, a little bit better image of it. Anyway, the same uh, flow through paper that we were just talking about, uh, they also went through and they did some studies on just the nanocluster um, size variation over time. And they didn't give very many data points and I really don't trust this fit at all. I think it's kind of bogus that they would actually even put a fit on a four points like this. But what you can see is there's a pretty good indication that the initial few minutes, even like the first five minutes of mixing this stuff together is probably when you're getting the highest concentration of these gold 32 nanoclusters or nanoclusters that are of the same size. And then you rapidly decay and the Oswald ripening just kind of destroys them all rather quickly. And so what could we do to get more data points in this area? That's kind of what I want to focus on. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, because I think this is, this is like the most important part and it has a few data points. So how fast can the synthesis occur? I want to find that out. And how can the decay be stopped? The same paper gives us a few different options for stopping the decay. They use dilution and temperature control. So you cool it off, it slows things down, or you, you dilute it and then you know, they get farther apart in the solution and they don't interact with each other as much. So I want to take that a little bit a step further because I don't want to just want to know what's happening in the first few minutes. I want to know what's happening in the first few hundreds or thousands or millions of a second. And so what I'm thinking is if I can send uh, using syringe pumps and a static mixer, if I can send these two solutions together, get strong static mixing, I'd have to have probably high pressure, but I could use maybe an HPLC pump instead of the syringe pump itself to do this. But then we do what's called splat cooling. And I don't know if any of you have heard of splat cooling, but it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Didn't even mean to do that, but <laughs> what you do is they have a large metal drum and it's rotating in a bath of liquid nitrogen. And you keep it going until the drum itself is 77 kelvins. And then you have your solution that actually drops and it splatters on the surface of that drum. When it splatters, of course, it becomes extremely thin. And so with splat cooling, you're able to achieve cooling rates of millions of degrees per second. Just pretty cool. I don't know if it's necessarily <laughs> important in this. We might could get away with you know an uh, ice cold beaker, but you got to dream big, you know. So the goal is we want to do rapid synthesis. We want minimal aging. The advantage is, is we can adjust the dwell time using the static mixer and the pressure of incoming fluids, and that's pretty neat because if we choose the right static mixer, we could have a pretty wide range of dwell times in that static mixer. Um, just based on the pressures that we push, that we push with. Um, and then the samples are already going to be ready for cryoanalysis because they're frozen. And you can do all kinds of fun things with them. You could freeze dry them if you wanted to try that out. You could take them over to the uh, cryo TEM. Um, and I have looked into different methods of mass spectrometry that use um, frozen samples. And they, they shoot them with lasers and different things like that. So we have extreme cooling rates and then of course, there's, there's a whole cluster of different types of techniques that we could use to study this. But that's basically um, what we're looking at. So smaller seeds are crucial for nanolab growth. I think we've shown that. Uh, the seed size increases rapidly with time. It's, you know, you, you don't have a big window. You got a short shelf life. And then um, we plan to do this rapid synthesis and splat cooling. Maybe not splat cooling, but we're going to do some rapid cooling. I don't know how rapid. We might make dipping dots out of this stuff. So, but, um, and yeah, I'd like to, I'll end the presentation just uh, briefly, maybe I can minimize this.
And I wanted to show you something a little bit more fun. Um, so in conjunction with this, we're looking at studying the structure of the nanocluster more in depthly to get a better idea of how it works and um, kind of electronic structures and maybe do some uh, density functional theory on that. And so what I've done here is, this is just a, a dumb little file where I can define different shells. Uh, so we have the two inner shells are gold, two outer shells are the bromine, and then we have a lithium um, as a counter ion. Instead of putting the C tab to the C tab, I don't even want to go there yet. But at some point, I'll put the C tab in there. I just need to do some reorientations on axes and different things to get it to, to get into the point file. So what this does is it generates a point file, all of the XYZ coordinates, and then it outputs it as an Avogadro file. And so I'm just going to run that real quick. And then I'll go to my uh, files here. And there it is. It just popped in. Let's see what it looks like. Come on, Avogadro. So there we go. We got a nice little, uh, nice little point file. You can see um, here we have the gold inner shells. The red is the bromine, and then the lithium would be these purple, these purples. Go back to the slideshow now, and let's see. I'm gonna take over. Okay. I'd like to. Uh, Thank Dr. Wetton. Um, Jesus helped me quite a bit. Uh, he's done a lot of nanocluster synthesis. And then uh, we're working with Todd Mar Martinez on the um, computational fluid, or not, it's not CFD, it's the uh, density functional theory. We're working with him. He does a lot of that, uh, a lot of GPU enhanced. And uh, also Dr. Yakuman, um, and Mo, and Marcos Alvarez. So with that, I'll take any questions that you have. So, like I said, it's called it's the Oswald ripening. So these little these little clusters, if you think about it in terms of surface area to volume ratio, they have huge surface area to volume ratios. And so that's energetically unfavorable. They want to be bigger, and so if they can, what they'll do is they'll get close to another one, and then the other one. I don't know exactly how it works. I think it's kind of a little mystery box. But when they get close enough to each other, the little ones sacrifice themselves and they become part of the bigger one. It's kind of like the uh, you know, water droplets, how they coalesce. But the problem is, is when they get so big, they just can't make the nanocluster right because you need that high energy for the little unpacking and the growth of the nano rod to happen. Because what happens is when you get, you know, the, the new reduction solution and you've got gold and it kind of opens up its end and it does its own little self-assembly thing. And if you don't have those right characteristics, especially the size, it's too big, then it's just, instead of opening up and growing in one direction, it's just gonna grow in all directions, I think. Yeah. Do I model the cluster, the gold breeding cluster with the counter ion instead of just, I know c tabs huge, but you can just use the amine part of that with your set. The tertiary flushing thing you need. I mean, that's the ligand you need. That's actually coordinated to gold. Yeah, um, yeah, we definitely thought about doing that. We looked at uh, different types of things. The lithium was just something to kind of be a placeholder yeah. at this point, just something to to be there because <laughs> this actually wasn't supposed to be in the in the presentation. I was uh, just playing with MATLAB. I was talking to Dr. Wetton over lunch, and so we made the edits to include those counter ions just while we were eating. <laughs> The related question, that crystal structure you showed us, is that actually a crystal structure from with C tab or the leaf? Uh, which crystal structure? Sure it's a crystal structure from the leaf. Oh, yeah, that one is different. That's what you thought. Okay, that's my point. Yeah, that one, that. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but that comes from a, a, German, a, a German publication where they're using some different counter, or some different ligands. Yeah, any other questions? Let's see. We go to the top. Oh. Oh yeah. 
Go go right ahead. You want to pull up the Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's complicated. Because I I'm looking at this screen, but We can't hear you if you're if you're there. Oh, I can hear you now. Uh, uh, okay, my uh, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, very, very nice work, and I like the way you understand the, the physics of this. Well, what I'd like to suggest is maybe you try uh, clusters or nano rows of two meters. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, you combine answer. two or three metals, then then the system is dominated by the entropy, mm -hmm. not by the energy, and, and then it's a completely different ballgame. That would be really interesting to see. And if you have the DFT calculations possibility, you can even calculate the what the entropy role will be in, in this. Okay. okay. Yeah, that definitely is a great idea. I think uh, definitely there's there's a lot of possibilities, especially since gold has such a similar um, size to so many other metals that are around it. So I think a silver gold, we could try that out pretty easily or something like that. Okay, and you, your electromicrograph pictures you put there are obtained in the NAU electron microscope. What did you obtain? Oh, let me see if it, I'm not exactly sure these. Uh, uh, no, no, the other ones. Uh, the ones in which you have a more, uh, uh, if you advance, uh, well, doesn't matter. Does, doesn't matter. It's, uh, uh, oh, is it this? Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Those are me. Oh uh, yeah, I'd have to look that up. I don't think that's an age. I don't think that was done at ASU. I'll okay. have to look into it and get back to you on that. Okay. But yeah, they are pretty nice little micrographs. Okay. Because of course, Alex Lair can help you to get uh, micrographs of your pictures in the meantime that we get uh, uh, a new instrument. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about that instrument. So. Okay, and thank, very nice work, thank you. Uh, thank you. Are you performing the DFT testing or is it done by It'll be a little bit of both. So um, now that we've got this point file put together, I'm gonna send it over to him. He's gonna run it on his system a little bit just to see like how intensive it's gonna be. And then um, we're either gonna try it out on Monsoon here, or we might build our own little system so that we can just, you know, so play. You know what functionality? How do you know what you're gonna functionality? Uh, we're still working on that part. So yeah, like say, but um, yeah, initially we're just gonna to try to calculate the ground state, see if we can, because I think we got it pretty close to what the structure should be. So we're going to try to figure out, you know, what's, what's, it, what's that structure that it's going to want to be in. And, um, but as far as the details of all of that, I'm still, I'm still a novice at DFT for sure. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very novice. <laughs> One of these days, I'll have to talk to you about that. Go ahead. Yeah, you were in a hurry to go into the, um, the part where you have the Molecular formulas written out. Um, oh, this one. Yeah, maybe you can explain that. Yeah. Dr. Martinez's uh, question. Okay. Why is the bromine broken up into two uh, places in that form? Mm, that's a good question. Is there experimental logic to that? Or is artifact? I think this may be an artifact of, well, in this particular case, it's all bromine, but that's not always the case. I know the, um, some of the other studies that we were looking at, there was two different species of ligands that were attaching. And in those cases, you would get the square or the cubic attachment with one particular species, and then you get the icosahedral attachment with the other species. And I'm wondering if they just kind of carried that over into the same line of thinking with the all bromine. Bromine, so maybe it's that's a good question. Um, well, 
we'll have to give back to you on that one. <laughs> How do why, why, is the, why is the way of growing not going to Yeah, that was something you asked earlier. And in terms of all, you might want to call, call it an ammonia, like a quaternary ammonia. And so a quaternary ammonia is positively charged, as you see written with a plus sign there. But it's not an amine anymore. And it doesn't have a, um, there's no way for the light in a quaternary ammonia. Organic molecules coordinate directly to the metal. Okay. Um, is that good enough? Thank you. But in the structural formula that you showed later on, all 20 of the bromine, or what we should call them bromides, uh, are, um, are represented as equivalent in equivalent size, right? Yeah. And then you need the ammonium counter ions, cations, if you want to regard them that way, as uh, undetermined. Um, yeah, for now we just kind of threw them in here. Or you put them somewhere. Because it looked pretty. So, <laughs> yeah. And then this was, this was actually, um, I was trying to see if Avogadro would, would identify NH4 as anything special, but it just puts it as an un unidentified XX. So that's what this was. We we're going to try to throw NH4 as the counter ion in there to be a little bit closer to the C tab. So, yeah. so, anybody else? <laughs> I, think, I think we'll wrap it up then. Thanks. Thank you.